Fashion is a word that means many different things to many different people. And in the world of runway, we can see all sorts of unique looks, silhouettes, and shapes across a broad variety of styles. But for those of us on the dark side, one has to wonder, does horror exist in fashion? I presented a lecture to my stream discussing this very topic, so let's check it out. Today's lecture is Horror in Couture, and Analysis in Aesthetics, Meaning, and Show Review. The shows we will be reviewing are the spring and summer 2024 shows of Robert Wood and Maison Margiela, and we will get that into that in a bit. But today, what we are going to be talking about is the generalized question of, is there really horror in high fashion? What does that look like? What kind of aesthetics does that bring? What do people do? What do people think of when it comes to that? Um, but before we can talk about that, we have to talk about this. So before we dive into our runway shows, let's learn some definitions, shall we? Couture. Haute couture, it comes from French. It essentially means high sewing or high dressmaking. Um, it can often refer to either needlework or sewing, depending. Couture is an abbreviation of haute couture. Haute couture essentially means higher sewing, higher dressmaking. It denotes a elevated quality of work in terms of technique, construction, and overall design than say something you would find at your typical retail store. Now this term is protected by law in France and it's regulated by the Chambre Syndicale de la Haute Couture. And that was founded in 1868 and this institution determines which fashion houses qualify as couture and they maintain a list and members kind of come and go off of that list. To conclude, these are the requirements to be considered a couture house. So down the list, made to order designs for private clients with at least one fitting. You must maintain at least one workshop or atelier with at least 15 general staff and an additional 20 full-time technical workers, okay? So there's the general staff and then there's the technical workers, your, your pattern drafters, your tailors, things like that. Collections must have a minimum of 50 designs presented in January or July. So guest designers are invited each season, so spring, summer. And if you are invited four times, you become eligible for membership. Your work is recognized as having that higher couture quality when i say horror in fashion what do you guys think of like do you think of things like this maybe like uh we have the the jason Voorhees jersey from spirit halloween astra i saw you on twitter you mentioned the cenobites from hellraiser or do you even think of just like uh goth clothing like in general like what do you guys think of i define horror personally as any form of media that works with what would society would be considered like, like societally excuse me would consider a darker theme so things like death violence murder etc etc presented with perhaps a certain kind of overtone it's very difficult actually to describe um and what i showed are examples of retail options or costuming and retail options and costuming because of the level of work don't necessarily qualify for the runway and couture labels so there are several examples of like creepy couture horror and fashion um, darker themes, dark aesthetics, people have pulled from sci-fi, it's been going on for forever, but it can be hard to find because you can't really delineate what is high fashion and what isn't if you don't really know what you're looking for. So, the first layer of our iceberg is referred to as high-end reference. What does this mean? High-end, high, like a well-known brand, a brand with uh, renown. Not necessarily, it could or could not be a couture brand, but it is a brand whose clothing starts at a higher price point than, say, average retail pricing that makes a direct reference to a movie, book, or some other horror media, usually using direct imagery from the franchise, such as characters or locations, colors, etc., etc. Then we have our second layer going a little bit deeper. You have what I ca am calling ambiguous reference. So the items that are shown on the runway that use a similar design or structure to the material they are referencing 
but they aren't using, say, pictures of the characters or the title of the work or anything like that. It falls into the if you know, you know sort of territory, right? Um, and then the deepest layer, you have what I am referring to as direct symbolism. So it essentially cuts the fat. It's not referencing an established horror media. It is going straight through, straight to the concept that may discomfort or disturb the viewer looking at it clothing and presentation of that clothing as well that evokes the ideas of like discomfort death other themes etc so we are going to talk about the first layer of our fashion iceberg called high-end reference so our example of high-end reference today is jw anderson's carry collection so J.W. Anderson, they are a higher-end brand, usually women's ready-to-wear. And ready-to-wear is a fashion term, meaning that it doesn't require any tailoring. There are no custom fittings needed for this clothes. You essentially order it and go, right? So they deal in what I describe as typical couture concept clothing. They have a lot of tops with creative drapery, um, a lot of pants that have a lot of different silhouettes to them they they're in that range and their price points start around 110 dollars usd so in this outfit here now there was an entire collection that jw anderson did for specifically the 1976 film adaptation of stephen king's carrie and here we see that that print that print of the character's face has been placed on a very well-structured button-up shirt and a nice straight leg pant. Now you're asking, Faye, this just looks like printed material. What makes it high-end? Excellent question. What makes it high-end is the fact that this shirt is a silk printed shirt. And the pants, same thing. These pants are satin pants. These materials are of a finer quality. They can be a bit more difficult to work with because silk and satin are quite slippery and require more time and effort to make sure that your stitching is clean and neat and up to standard. Much like the Jason Voorhees jersey, that is a direct referential to a horror piece of media. And it's high end because of the materials and construction technique used to create a clean silhouette. Now we move into our second iceberg layer, which is ambiguous reference. Ambiguous reference, for those of us just coming in, ambiguous reference in terms of horror fashion is an item that uses similar designs or cuts or silhouettes to the character's or locations in the film that they are referencing, or book, or game, movie, what have you. It's not, there aren't any, like with the JDW Anderson, there aren't going to be any prints of the characters' faces or titles or anything like that. So, our example for ambiguous reference is going to be Altuzara Spring Summer 2024. Altuzara is a women's ready-to-wear brand, and their price points start in the 1000 usd range the designer specifically said that this collection is meant to exude a sort of haunted enigmatic practical kind of allure it's rooted in everyday apparel and you can see that in the way that this is structured and shaped now what we were let in on is that this designer in particular was influenced by the 1968 psychological horror film Rosemary's Baby. Now, you would not have known that if I had not told you. And you can see, and for those that know the film, those that know the character, know that those that know Rosemary know that uh, there were a lot of pastels and such that Rosemary would wear in the film, and you can see the 60s influence in the silhouette here because those more looser, sort of longer hang off the body type dresses were what was popular during that time period. And now we are going to get into our direct symbolism. Now we get into our final layer of our horror fashion iceberg, which is direct symbolism. And going back to our definitions, direct symbolism, I have defined this term as these clothes are not referencing horror media. They are referencing horror itself. They are referencing the dark, unsettling themes that horror media tends to engage in play with. With that in mind, direct symbolism. This is Garrett Pugh's 
spring summer of 2015. Now Garrett Pugh, finding things about him was a little bit difficult because Garrett Pugh exists very much on the fringe of the fashion world. A lot of his earlier works actually were not available for anyone to purchase and he often uses his works as a form of experimentation and he's also known for doing a lot of club wear which I find really interesting. Uh, he is known mostly for the way he uses shapes and forms in his designs. This particular collection from 2015 contains a lot of this demonic imagery in the form of steer masks. There's a lot of cult symbolism, religious overtones, and implied death. These are concepts that are super popular horror tropes, and you see them all throughout horror media. This is deliberately designed to upset your eyes, and if your eyes can't make everything symmetrical, it your brain gets visibly upset because that tells your brain that something is wrong. So it invokes that feeling of unease by simply misaligning the pattern by about a centimeter or two. I included this piece here, the bag, the burlap piece, because I wanted to demonstrate uh, the implied death concept from his collection i.e. via suffocation via burlap bag. And then, of course, as Newt pointed out, the satanic panic, you actually have a... If I lean away here, you can see... There we go. The pentagram-like symbol that sort of harnesses the dress together. And that is just cutting straight through the fat, straight, straight right to what people would find creepy and disturbing, but it doesn't lean too far into that stereotypical goth or alt apparel look. So that, th those are our concepts, all right? We have our direct symbolism, our ambiguous reference, and our high-end reference. So our primary discussion for today is the 2024 shows of Robert One and Maison Margiela. And before we get into their shows, I'm going to give you a bit of background of each. We'll be discussing Robert One first and then Maison Margiela. Um, Robert One, we have a lot of pictures for. And for Maison Margiela, I actually have some video, some footage that I want to show you guys. So, uh, Robert One, brief speedrun style background. Uh, he was he is a Hong Kong born and London based fashion designer. He launched his brand in 2014 and he debuted his first official couture collection just last year in 2023. So he's he just became a member of the couture world. From what I was reading about, he apparently became inspired to pursue fashion because of an older girl he saw in church and he thought that she just looked really cool. And he wanted to try to emulate the vibes that she gave off, essentially. One professes, he sees a po sort of poetry, a kind of beauty within the horror genre. So a lot of his works connect directly to those concepts. Not all of them, but quite a few. This collection in particular was mixed in with a quite a few more quote-unquote conventional pieces. Um, or pieces that were a little bit more on the sci-fi sort of avant-garde side. This dress here was actually inspired by the scene in The Matrix where Trinity falls out of the window and you see her surrounded by all those pieces of broken glass. So this piece in our slideshow, immediately what you think of head trauma, you think maybe even zombie imagery. You think perhaps even that Oren Ishii scene from Kill Bill. <laughs> so what this hat is made of here, this detail on the hat and the blood tears on the face here, these are all Swarovski crystals, hand-placed individual Swarovski crystals. The way the hat obscures the face really leans into that sort of implicit sadness from that tear detail. Um, especially here, very well done. The crystallized texture, really for me, and perhaps even for you, gives a sense of... One, it adds to that chopped up, ground up meat texture. And for two... It gives this sort of thing. When I look at this, I can feel the pinpricks in my hand and it makes me want to pull my hand away even though I'm not actually reaching out and touching it. There is a kind of roughness in this exposed sort of area 
And it makes, and while it looks beautiful, it, 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 you don't want to touch it. It almost, you know, my brain goes, oh, if I touch that, it's going to hurt her, i.e. the model. Now, this piece in the show was referenced directly as a bloody wedding gown. And if you look at the detail shot, it actually almost looks like flowers. And I find that really interesting because then you get an interplay of passion, of love, of pain. And not to mention another common horror trope, murderous brides or a dead bride. There's usually always some dead ghost bride looking to get, ju looking to get hers somewhere. <laughs> But you see just, or that, bl or the Black Widow even, you know, Black Widow in a white gown, like walking in the blood of perhaps whatever she may have done. And it goes all the way up the boot, all the way up the dress and so on. You could also argue that there's a feminine rage quality to this piece. This, 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 <laughs> all of this <laughs> right here, you immediately have the red color you have this there is a multifaceted aspect here where this could be a supernatural entity this could be uh your own guilt on your back it is it represents sensuality and the demonization of sexuality and in particular feminine sexuality um almost in a literal sense the way it's coming out of her back here, it it's very much that common trope in horror where sex is seen as dangerous and risky as something that will get you killed or hurt. Um, I see a lot of guilt for self-love in this piece, for embracing one's own sensuality from this. Yeah, literally, it, it, it could be an entity doing it, or it could be a representation of the self wanting to engage in that kind of act, g gently tugging at the strap. And that's why I wanted to talk about Robert Wood's shows, because these are stellar examples of horror tropes within fashion, some being quite literal with the headpiece and others not so much. And the artistry in having the figure coming out of, I can't imagine the sheer amount of supportive garments that must be underneath this gown in order to make all of this work. And the hand details are just so delicate and well done. It's truly remarkable. Um, to conclude for this part of the lecture, this was actually the closing piece for the uh, Robert One show. And I think it was an excellent piece to close on because it really makes you think. It really, really, really gets your mind going. Um, because speaking of twitchy movement, Maison Margiela. So, brief background on Maison Margiela. They are a luxury fashion house headquartered in Paris. They were previously named Maison Martin Margiela as the House of Margiela was founded by Belgian designer Martin Margiela and Jenny Mirrens in 1988. So this is a 80s fashion brand. Now, the individual in question that actually did the show, that actually designed the show that we are talking about, is John Galliano. So John Galliano is a British fashion designer, but he was born in Gibraltar. He was formerly the creative director of not only his own brand, but the French couture houses of Givenchy and Dior. And if you like designer clothes, you know exactly who Givenchy and Dior are. But for those who may not know, they're incredibly high-end fashion brands. Uh, and he became the creative director uh, of Maison Margiela in 2014. And he was the one that spearheaded this show that I am about to show to you guys. Dior is kind of seen as classic in terms of the fashion world, at least from what I understand of it, because this is just as much a learning experience for me as it is for all of you. So Maison Margiela Spring 24. The base concept for this runway was broken dolls, haunted objects, very common theme, especially in o older horror films, and we're getting some of it back in some of our more modern movies. Silent Hill, exactly, very good. There are strategically ripped materials here and here. You can see the kind of hand accessory on the fingers down here that kind of give the model a jointed look. 
They the rips at the elbows here also emphasize uh, the look of ball joints. And then you can see here in this bottom quarter photo, um, they even have her stand in a certain way so that she looks sort of disjointed and broken and not quite like a person. What I really love is how they've managed to emphasize the size of the hands. They've made the hands larger. They've, um, through corsetry, have nipped in the waist and emphasized the hip. They used a lot of padding and a lot of technique to get these, um, to change the shape of the model's bodies. Yes, big hands for the win. Down here, you can see more of those ripped details. It's almost like her stuffing is coming out in sort of a way. Mm, yeah, even the lace, it has that old haunted attic sort of look, something that you would find in a chest in a back room that you likely weren't supposed to open. But you did it anyway, didn't you? <laughs> now, I say doll. Doll, you think porcelain. Yes? Yes. Look at this face. Look at this makeup. And then the chest piece here to emphasize that porcelain sort of skin. Now, the person that did this is makeup artist Pat McGrath. Pat McGrath developed a special glass skin technique um, using some products. I will show you some video footage here in just a second. Um, Pat McGrath is also a black makeup artist, a black female makeup artist who has, is essentially just the makeup artist in the industry. Her work is beyond fucking stunning. Um, and she created these porcelain skin doll looks. We're gonna watch a couple minutes of the masterclass that she did on Instagram. Someone managed to record the entire hour long course. I jumped into the video where she shows some of the products so you can see like where her thought process was at with making it. So we'll watch like a minute or two of that. So let's pop over to here. Mm -hmm. exactly. it's a little nerve -wracking. So what she's saying is that, so she's done the initial makeup here on the model. So the way they got the look to look so smooth is with airbrushing. And once you airbrush the model, if anything gets messed up, you kind of can't really go back without doing the whole thing all over again. That's what so, I'm looking for. So just to show you, as I said, mm -hmm. three years of doing this, mm -hmm. Make this. I don't know if anybody can see. Can okay. See? We can see. There. These are all different peel off gel face masks. So, the reason this was so difficult, especially through the airbrush, is because these are all gel. These are all gel based peel off masks, right? There. See? Peel off masks. This show took like two years to do. This show took years to develop, and she had developed this technique of thinning out, of diluting these gel masks so that they could go through an airbrush spray so that they could create this glossy doll look. So to complete the concept, the models walked in a manner that was very, very uncanny. When I show you the video, you're going to be able to hear and see and just the, you'll see. I, I can't describe it or it'll spoil the whole thing. Um, again, their body proportions, heavily exaggerated. Um, the Just heavily exaggerated in order to give that sort of inhuman appearance. Then you can see the doll hair. She's lovely. Um, the matching porcelain neck piece. But yes, the use of corsetry in, and padding, a lot of padding was also used in the show. So the use of corsetry and padding in order to give these huge, these, these wide hips and to broaden out the shoulders um, to really sort of emphasize all those shapes. And then you can even see down here, there's mismatched shoes. So now we are going to watch a couple minutes um, or a minute or so of the Maison Margiela show. Thank you. 
See there, there too, the way she, she picked her leg up and then put it back down, the way everyone is sort of wobbling ever so slightly as they move. Now there's a particular scene coming up. Like it like even the way the way she's like you saw her holding her arm out as though she had been posed. The stage, the music, the way the music sounds like clock parts, the way the models can are sort of timing their movements to be ever so slightly off to that ticking noise that we hear in the music. It's all very deliberate. It evokes a very haunted sort of feeling, a lot of raw emotion in such a way. It is... When you put... When you start thinking about it, it actually starts to become very, very, very creepy. There. Right there. That. That is what I really wanted you to see, is that little bit of walking there. Because that demonstrates exactly what I was talking about. That unsettling, moving doll appearance. So, what I want to say about this, and though it was brief, there is horror in fashion, in couture, in a more abstract way that exists outside of the alternative community, that exists outside of the, you know, putting a movie on a t-shirt. And not to say that those things are bad, they're wonderful, I wear them myself, they're fantastic, but there is a world beyond that that invites you to play and explore and what I'm hoping to have achieved by showing you this and by talking about these shows by talking about Puth and Woon and Margiela and J.W. Anderson and Ultrazara and everything like that is to encourage people not only to look into these kinds of clothes for yourselves but to play with them play with these ideas my wisdom is this if you take anything away from this lecture explore horror there is so much more out there especially with clothes that you can do to get the point across and it has been here and it has always been here it has been here for forever mcqueen shows have done it dior has done it at some point Every, the, it has been so proliferate in the fashion world, and now it's back on the rise again, and I genuinely hope to see more people engaging and indulging in these aesthetics, in their clothes, maybe even in their VTubers. Whatever you guys, like, want, that is what I hope to come away from. And the second thing that I hope to come from this is that the big fashion terms seem less frightening or like not maybe frightening but i hope they seem a lot less intimidating to you now and that is what i am hoping to have accomplished here and so with that being said before i start getting misty eyed <laughs> thank you genuinely thank you all so much